and welcome to our online service from Mountain View United Church for the 13th Sunday in Pentecost, August 30th, 2020. It's hard to believe that the year is more than half over and that the pandemic has lasted this long. I'm sure none of us dreamt that we'd still be worshiping online. I pray that you will feel God's presence among you as we worship separate yet together and that God's Holy Spirit will bless each and every one of you. Amen. Please join me now in our call to worship. Holy, holy, holy. Holy God is here. Holy, 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 love has called us here. Holy, 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 we gather to worship our holy God. Let us say our opening prayer together. Let us pray. Holy God, we come this day into this sacred moment and this sacred space, aware that your holiness is always around us. Surround us with your wondrous love that we might be wise enough to understand your call and be brave enough to follow your path. Amen. One day, Jesus and his disciples were on their way to Jerusalem. A rich young leader came running to Jesus. He got down on his knees and asked Jesus a question. 
Good teacher, what do I need to do to live with you forever in heaven when I die? Good teacher, why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. I believe you are from God, teacher. Hmm. Well, to answer your question, you know the Ten Commandments, right? You must not murder. You must not be unfaithful to your wife. You must not steal. You must not tell lies. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Oh yes, teacher. I've obeyed all these commandments since I was a kid. Is that all? Jesus looked at the man with a smile. He loved this young man. Jesus really wanted this man to follow him and could see what was holding him back. Well then, there's still one thing you haven't done. Go and sell everything you own and give your money to the poor so you will have treasure in heaven. Then I want you to come follow me and be one of my disciples. When the man heard this, his face fell. Instead of saying yes to Jesus' offer, he walked away feeling sad. He didn't want to give up his stuff. It would be easier for a camel to walk through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. You can't get there holding on to the things you love here on earth. You have to let go of the things on earth to grab on to the things of heaven. The disciples wondered, who in the world could be saved then? Isn't that too hard for anyone to do? With your own human strength, it is impossible. But with God's strength, everything is possible. Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, said, We've given up everything to follow you, Jesus. Yes, you have. And I promise you that everyone who has given up everything to follow me and spread the good news will receive a reward a hundred times better. In life on earth, you'll face hard times and suffering but you'll get eternal life. Those who are the greatest now will be the least important then. Those who seem the least important now will be the greatest in heaven. Touched me, oh, he touched. 
Let us confess our sins before God as we join together in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. In the midst of your holy presence, O God, we encounter a mystery deeper than the foundations of the earth. You are who you are, sacred and indefinable. Forgive us when we try to put you in a box or frame you in our own image. Help us as we allow your divine image to define and shape us. Speak mercy and grace to us when we deny the path before us. And guide us with your shepherding love when we are unsure of how to follow. Strengthen us and give us the courage to say, Here I am, ready to love and serve in your holy name. We pray. Amen. My friends, hear these words of comfort. We are in the presence of the Holy One, whose holiness is in our very being. Rejoice and be glad, for in Christ's love we are reminded of this divine truth. We are God's beloved creation, reclaimed for a holy path. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our New Testament reading comes to us from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, beginning at verse 9. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not become, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Our Gospel reading is taken from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 16, beginning at verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed 
and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with the angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here now who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Can you imagine it? One moment Jesus is saying, you're the rock on which I will build my church. And the next he's calling you a stumbling block. It's such a reversal of relational fortune that it had to be incredibly painful. Can you just imagine it? And perhaps that's the difficulty. Peter couldn't imagine. He couldn't imagine that Jesus had come not just to comfort people, but to free them. Comforting isn't that hard. Just give them a little more of what they already had and tell them it will be all right. But freedom is different. Freedom requires that they see what they have isn't life-giving in the first place. The common assumption is that when Peter declared that Jesus was the Messiah, he had in mind a warrior king like David, one who would drive out the Romans and liberate the Israelites. The Romans were foreign occupiers, not only imposing Roman law, but taxing the people to support their occupation and backing up their occupation, order, and taxation by violence. The problem with Peter's expectation is not that it's unreasonable, but that it doesn't change anything. Rome is there in force and by violence. Jesus, the warrior king, uses greater force and violence to drive them out. And eventually, someone with even more force or willing to do greater violence takes over yet again. Who's in charge may change, but the wheel of force and violence keeps revolving. Jesus knows this. He knows that by introducing a different logic, one that runs by forgiveness, mercy, and love rather than retribution, violence, and hate, he is challenging the powers that be. Moreover, he knows that the wheel of force and violence will not tolerate his obstruction, but run him over. And this Peter just couldn't imagine. It isn't surprising when you stop to think about it that Jesus was killed. From the moment of his birth, he is such a threat to the rule of force and violence that Herod is willing to slaughter all children under the age of two in the hope of destroying him. No, it's no surprise. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's no surprise that Jesus was killed. 
What's surprising is that God raised Jesus from the dead. Resurrection reinforces that Jesus' life, love, and sacrifice are ultimately what will prevail. It's hard to imagine, I know, in light of how the prevalent force and violence seem in the world, but it is just what Jesus invites us to, lives shaped by love and forgiveness and actions shaped by compassion and hope. It's also very hard to imagine. Like Peter, what we most often want is a little more of what the world already offers. But Jesus didn't come to comfort us with a little more, but instead to free us. And freedom just means realizing that we've settled for something that isn't life-giving so that we can hear God's promise of not just more of the same, but something different, so that we can hear God's promise of life, a promise that means something only after what we previously accepted as life dies. And here's the thing. I don't need to tell you that people are dying or that the world has disappointed them or that they've settled for less than God's hope. The evidence is all around. The disappointing relationship, the illness that returned, the career that ended, the untimely death mourned, the disappointment at looming. Our job isn't to tell people what's wrong, but simply to ask to whisper even the question of whether they are ready for something different, for something more, and then to help them imagine the life Jesus promises. And that's the hard part, because giving someone another chance instead of writing them off, forgiving someone who has wronged us instead of seeking retribution, being open-handed and generous with the resources we've been blessed with instead of holding on to whatever we can, offering our future to God rather than planning each step, seeking joy and service rather than acquisition because we've accepted that what the world has offered is all there is. These different things often feel at first like death, even like dying on the cross before God uses them to raise us to new life. It's an act of imagination. But as we take even these small steps forward, God is at work, giving us a taste of what we'd never thought possible and multiplying the impact of our actions far beyond what we dreamed until suddenly, just as it felt like we'd lost our lives, we find them. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that God is at work in and through your life for the good of the world? Can you imagine that our congregation has something of value to offer to its community? Can you imagine that when you befriend the lonely or encourage the frightened, heaven rejoices? Can you imagine that though afraid, when you stand up to those who spew hate, God is with you? Can you imagine that even small acts of love and generosity challenge the world, order, and introduce a different reality. Can you imagine that God wants for us not just comfort, but freedom? Can you imagine that love is more powerful than hate? And can you imagine that God raised Jesus from the dead? Sanctify our imaginations this week, O oh God, 
and help us to see, taste, and believe the life-giving promises of the Messiah who came, not to give us what we want, but what we need. Amen. Offering our gifts to God is a holy act. In this sacred moment, we remember the gifts that we have received this week and we give thanks for them. And we offer our lives to the holy work of God. Let us pray. In gratitude for your amazing works in the world, we offer our gifts to further your work, Holy One. Bless us as you bless those before us, that we may be a blessing of your holy work. Guide our steps and bless the offerings we bring, that the world may be touched by your holy love. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for glimpses of your glory, for the beauty of a maritime sunrise calling us to our daily tasks, and for the wonder of a maritime sunset calming our busy and sometimes troubled spirits. There is so much about our world we do not understand. Beside the beauty and the wonder, there are wars, people who hurt and who are hungry, people who are afraid, alone, and unhappy. And above all, there is the pandemic to deal with now, which is very scary to many people and has affected our lives in ways we never could have imagined. Assure us, loving God, that you have not abandoned your world. When we despair at the evening news, strengthen our faith and renew our purpose. Set us afire with a vision of your will. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, God. Grant us the strength to be your people, even when we do not understand. And keep us alive to the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
As we leave this sacred space of worship, may we leave with the words of the benediction fresh in our minds. God sends us to serve. Here I am, ready to serve. God sends us to love. Here I am, ready to love. God sends us to bless the world. Here I am, ready to bless the world. Amen.